Hey guys, so welcome to chapter seven as the semester rolls on. We're looking at the three, three states of matter, intermolecular bonding forces, and then moving on to the gases themselves specifically, and looking at some of the gas laws which govern the interaction of a gas with parameters like uh, temperature changes, pressure changes, volume changes, and changes in the number of moles of gas. So as usual, we'll wet our appetite first with a little scenario. So you go scuba diving with some friends, nice if you can get it, and one of your friends returns to the surface quickly, a little bit too quickly, and they're in some discomfort and pain and struggling uh, once they get back to the surface. With the help of your friends, you grab them and return them back down to the bottom where you were scuba diving, and then more slowly bring them back up to the surface, 50 feet at a time roughly, waiting for maybe 25 to 30 minutes at a time. And so slowly bring them back up to the surface and they start to recover. We'll talk about this and how the water around you creates a change in pressure as you move to greater depths and what the gas laws tell us about changes in pressure. Another scenario, you're studying for an exam, biology exam with a friend, and you get a question wrong about the concentration of some of the bases in DNA, like adenine and thymine. We'll talk about DNA a little bit and talk about how the concentration of some bases can be related to the bases of others and why there's a relationship. Finally, looking at a list of cooking ingredients, you see the fatty acid, linoleic acid, and it's much better for you than trans fats like stearic acid. The picture here is of linoleic acid. So why is the linoleic acid here much better than an acid like stearic acid in your diet? We'll look at the formula, we'll look at the shape of the molecule and what it is it uh, helps for your health. Okay, let's get on to the chapter itself. But let me just check and see if my baby girl daughter is doing okay. She might be excited about um, her cartoon or something. One sec. All right, back again. So way back in the beginning, we had talked about the three states of matter solids, liquids, and gases. And we said that the state of matter depends on how strongly the molecules are held together. And that's why we needed to raise temperature, increase the kinetic energy to separate the molecules and atoms in a solid into a liquid when they can now move around each other because they can resist that force of attraction. Or from a liquid to the gas state, where the matter flies apart and we lose those intermolecular bonding forces. But we didn't at the time talk about what those forces of attraction were between the molecules, these intermolecular bonding forces. So now we're going to put a name to them and explain them. So we're not talking about chemical bonds between atoms to make molecules. We've already discussed this with covalent bonding and ionic bonding. We're talking about the attraction from one unit, one molecule, to a completely different molecule. Okay, that's better. So the first one we want to talk about is something that we're already partly familiar with, and that's the idea of dipole bonds that we talked about in chapter four. Polar covalent bonds which have a significant difference in electronegativity. And we said the range for polarity was between 1.5 to 1.9. What's my annotation tools for some reason? There they are, let's bring them back. So looking at these chemical bonds and looking at the electronegativities, we said the range for polarity was 0.5 up to 
1.9 inclusive, anything beyond 1.9 was an ionic bond. Anything less than 0.5 was a covalent bond, truly covalent bond. And so in this range from 0.5 up to 1.9, we do have a covalent bond, but the electrons have been drawn significantly towards the more electronegative element. And so if we look at the electron density, where the electrons are, the map of electron density would look a bit like this, with the electrons spending a lot of their time closer to the oxygen atom or the electrons spending a lot of their time closer to the bromine atom. Okay. So from moment to moment, the more electronegative element has the lion's share of the electron density. And so the less electronegative element has this delta positive charge, and the more electronegative element has this delta negative charge. It's like taking your bathtub and tipping it up at one end and all the water runs to one end of the bathtub when you tip it up. And so the bigger the difference in electronegativities, the more polarized the bond becomes, the more significant it becomes. And those are the kinds of things that we had talked about in chapter four to finish the chapter, when we talked about whether a molecule was polar or not from its polar covalent bonds or dipole bonds as they're sometimes called. Remember that dipole arrow runs from the less electronegative atom to the more electronegative. It's showing us where the electrons are heading. So if we have molecules with polar covalent bonds, those molecules align and stack up next to other molecules which also have polar covalent bonds. And they're stacking up to maximize that attraction between the electron enriched side of one bond, as we look at formaldehyde, which is used for pre preserving body parts in medicine. The electron enriched oxygen, it sides up close to the electron deficient end of the polar covalent bond on the adjacent molecule, the carbon end, and we get this intermolecular bonding force, a force of attraction between one molecule to another. And it's what we call a dipole to dipole interaction. There's the dipole bond on the first molecule. There's the dipole on the second molecule. So dipole to dipole interaction as shown by the red dots. And this is holding the molecules more tightly together and so it takes more energy, higher temperatures, to convert a chemical like this from the solid to the liquid phase or from the liquid phase to the gas phase. So physical properties like boiling points and melting points increase. If we do a comparison between butane and acetone, slightly different chemical formula, but with the same mass of 58 grams per mole, they're about the same size of molecule and we'd expect them to interact uh, for the most part in the same way with other matter. But they are significantly different because of this polar covalent bond in the acetone. The oxygen pulling electrons away from the carbon in this dipole bond. So molecules are holding on to each other more tightly and we see this elevation of the boiling temperature. 56 degrees compared to butane, which is only made up of um, non-polar carbon to carbon and carbon to hydrogen bonds. It is a boiling point just slightly below freezing temperature, minus 0.5 degrees Celsius. The bonds drawn as thick wedges or as dashes I'm just trying to show the bond coming towards you out of the page if it's a wedge and going back and away from you if it's a dashed line. Just a perspective kind of thing. So we see these dipole to dipole interactions leading to higher 
melting temperatures and boiling temperatures when we have molecules with polar covalent bonds. Now there's a special example of these kinds of dipole to dipole interactions, which makes them super strong compared to what we normally see. And we call this hydrogen bonding. And it happens for two reasons. We're talking about molecules which have polar bonds where one of the two atoms in the bond is a hydrogen atom. And this has a twofold effect. One, because the hydrogen has the a, one of the lowest electronegativities for non-metals, it normally means that the difference in electronegativity with the other non-hydrogen atom is significantly large, sometimes creeping up towards that 1.9 maximum before we move over into ionic bonding. The bigger the difference, the greater the polarity and the stronger the intermolecular bonding forces become, and so the higher the melting and boiling temperatures become. So that's one aspect, aspect of hydrogen, making this more significant. The other aspect is that hydrogen is the smallest element in the universe. It only has one shell of electrons, like helium atoms, and so when the molecules come up next to each other, because of that small size of the hydrogen, the molecules get physically closer to each other and it generates stronger attraction. Just like holding a North and South Pole magnets, the closer you hold them to each other, the stronger that attraction becomes. It's the same for molecules. So significantly that small size of a hydrogen atom leads to closer proximity and stronger forces of attraction. Now for this special super kind of dipole to dipole interaction that we call hydrogen bonding, it really just comes down to the presence of three chemical bonds, hydrogen to fluorine, hydrogen to nitrogen, and hydrogen to oxygen. Just about anything else isn't really hydrogen bonding. And we see a significant effect in relatively small molecules like ammonia, NH3, and water, H2O. That intermolecular bonding force, this hydrogen bonding between molecules of water, actually causes water to be more strongly bonded and a liquid at room temperature rather than a gas. Good thing too for life on this planet. Remember, for hydrogen bonding, the polar bond has got to include hydrogen. So molecu molecules with boron to hydrogen bonds wouldn't count because there isn't a big enough difference in electronegativity. It's got to be at least 0.5. Bonds with, or molecules with carbon to hydrogen bonds wouldn't necessarily count because again, there isn't a big enough difference in electronegativity. Same with sulfur to hydrogen. Then carbon to fluorine wouldn't count although it has a big enough difference in electronegativity to be a polar bond, it doesn't involve hydrogen. There might be hydrogen somewhere else in the molecule, but unless it's uh, one half of the polar covalent bond, it's not an example of hydrogen bonding. Now hydrogen bonding is crucial for life on this planet, as we'll see. Looking at the basic structure of DNA, deoxynucleic acid. We start off with the sugar beta-2 deoxyderibose and we link onto it phosphoric acid groups on either side of the sugar and then across the carbon number one we stick on one of four bases which are used for human DNA. And of course they build together like a links in a chain to form a strand of DNA. And then we get a complementary strand that aligns up with the first strand, chemically bonding with the first strand through those bases, which act like the rungs of a ladder. Now, when the two strands bind to each other, it causes the twisting of the molecule into that double helix through that chemical bonding. And the bonding force between the two bases, between the two strands, 
is hydrogen bonding. But it happens in a very particular way because the bases are very particular about who they bond with. Cytosine only ever bonds with guanine and thymine only ever bonds with adenine. So we never see cytosine with thymine or guanine with adenine or thymine with guanine, etc. These are the only two pairings we see. As we look at the structure of these bases, we can see why. It's about their capacity for hydrogen bonding. We can get one, two, three examples of hydrogen bonding between cytosine and guanine when they're next to each other. But thymine and adenine are only capable of two chemical bonds, two examples of hydrogen bonding. And so this is why the bases are so specific and fussy about who they're going to match with. I have to say, the discovery of the structure of DNA in the 20th century is probably one of the greatest um, landmark moments in science, at least to my mind. The work was done mostly by four scientists, James Watson, Francis Crick, Maurice Wilkins, and Rosalind Franklin. It was Watson and Crick who were actually given the Nobel Prize for the work. And unfortunately, they didn't give proper respect to some of the other people who worked on the structure of DNA. In particular, Rosalind Franklin, who was um, compared or it uh, was suggested that she was really nothing much more than just a lab technician. It's very hard to believe that they would have discovered the structure of DNA without Rosalind Franklin's pioneering crystallography work. She was an incredible woman. And it really points to the kind of chauvinism of Watson and Crick and a lot of science in general that women often don't get their due respect. It's really quite shocking. So there were lots of pieces that went to the puzzle and realizing that the concentration of adenine was always equal to the concentration of thymine in our DNA sample. And the concentration of guanine was always equal to the concentration of cytosine it was one of the big steps towards it. It's because of the way those bases only had to bond with one of the other three bases. So that's our second kind of intermolecular bonding force, hydrogen bonding. And it's much stronger than normal dipole to dipole interactions. Because when you have hydrogen involved in the dipole bond, that small size allows closer proximity between the molecules. The third and last kind of intermolecular bonding force that we want to talk about, and actually the weakest of the three, is what we call induced dipole to induce dipole interactions, sometimes referred to as van der Waals forces or London dispersion forces. So we're talking about molecules that don't have polar covalent bonds, nonpolar molecules with nonpolar bonds. But the atoms connected to each other by chemical bonds with electrons are not static. You've probably at some point seen a data table giving you bond lengths between atoms, depending on the size of the atoms. But these are something of a lie, or at least just an average length. Remember, those electrons are constantly moving around with kinetic energy. And so two bonds connected by, or two atoms connected by a bond, excuse me, those two atoms are always on the move because of the movement of the electrons. You can think about the atoms connected by a spring and the spring can expand, making the bond longer. It can contract, making the bond shorter, or it could wobble and wave from side to side, up and down, or out of plane, towards and away from you. So that bond is always on the move. The bond length is always changing. And it's a little bit like, again, having a bathtub 
being tipped up from one end of the bathtub. Like the tide coming in on shore on the beach, those electrons could collectively move to one side of the molecule. Just a slight movement, but it creates polarity in the molecule briefly. One side of the molecule electron enriched, and one side of the molecule, the side where the electrons are moving away from, one side of the molecule electron deficient. It creates polarity, we induce a dipole. Now for any molecules standing next door, excuse me, ah, I felt better. Some peanuts trapped in my throat. For any molecules next door, this sudden surge of electrons like the tide causes the electrons in the second molecule to be repelled away. And so we induce a dipole in the second molecule when this happens. And we set up this force of attraction between the two molecules for a brief period of time. The electron enriched side of one molecule attracted to the electron deficient side of the second molecule. But it's brief. And remember, just like the tide, the tide rolls back out and the electrons roll back to their original position. But then a couple of nanoseconds later, the electrons move again. And so the dipole reforms. And so the dipole to dipole interaction reforms again. So these forces of attraction are intermittent. They're sporadic. And it's a little bit like watching Christmas tree lights flash on and off all around the tree. Because it isn't a constant force of attraction, it's the weakest of the three kinds of intermolecular bonding force. And it's also the easiest to disrupt and break up. These molecules, very weakly attracted to each other, can have that attraction force disrupted by making the molecule more irregular in shape. Take some of the Lego bricks from the end and stick them on the middle. So we take this nice, neat, regular molecule, which looks like a, a rectangle from its edges, which is easy to stack and give close proximity. We put these sticky out bits or branches, as are sometimes known, along the main chain. And the molecules now don't pack together as tightly. We don't see bricks with sticky out bits if you want to pack them tightly together. And when the molecules become less, ir less regular or become more irregular, they don't pack together tightly. And so we lose that force of attraction that we had when the molecules were regular and able to stack close to each other. So compared to the regular shaped molecules, the irregular have much lower boiling temperatures. The more irregular the shape, the lower the boiling and melting temperatures become. Now related to that, we have to think about um, fatty acids for a little bit as we think about diet and human health. So we need to know a little bit about organic chemistry 142. We often have hydrocarbon molecules, molecules with hydrogen and carbon, which are literally hundreds or even thousands of carbons long in the main chain. So organic chemists often think this is a bit of a waste of time, but it's mostly just carbon and hydrogen. So we draw the backbone of the molecule, those carbon bonds, but we omit the chemical symbol for carbon. So if we wanted to draw them back in, each time the line changes thickness or changes direction, it's the implied position of a carbon atom. The implied position of a carbon atom. Now, at least we have the line representing the carbon to carbon bond still drawn in. So we can imagine where the carbons appear. Not only do we not draw in the hydrogens, but we don't even draw the chemical bond from the carbon to the hydrogen. But we know that carbon and the other elements in the beginning of the table are normally looking for an octet, four pairs of electrons to complete their shell. 
So at any carbon position, we can take the number four and subtract the number of bonds, the number of lines from it, to tell us the number of hydrogens, which should be attached at that position. So this carbon with one, two bonds, to complete its octet, there are two carbon to hydrogen bonds, which have been omitted for clarity. One along here, one, two, three chemical bonds. So to make four, just one more, one carbon to hydrogen bond, as we see in the original structure. I don't want you to worry about that too much. It just gives you background for these line angle formulas that we're drawing. So fatty acids make up a sizable portion of a diet. And we used to use a lot of, or consume, a lot of things like stearic acid. It's a very rod-like molecule because it's very long and thin. Looks a little bit like a very long rectangle. So the molecules can stack on top of each other very efficiently with close proximity and strong intermolecular bonding forces. Very strong because we have this polar covalent carbon to oxygen bond, which allows for dipole to dipole interactions and the polar covalent oxygen to hydrogen bond, which we said allows for hydrogen bonding. So with the strongest kind of intermolecular bonding forces available, and that rod-like, that regular shape to the molecule, it's not a surprise that the melting temperature of stearic acid is a very high 70 degrees Celsius. That's a problem if you're consuming these stearic acid molecules as part of your diet, because a lot of the stearic acid ends up in your bloodstream, in your blood plasma. And your body temperature is only 38 degrees, roughly. So anything that melts at 70 degrees hasn't melted. It's still trying to be a solid in the blood plasma and it's therefore thickening your blood, making it more viscous. And that's going to lead to problems for your heart, trying to pump blood through the body when the blood is that much thicker. However, we do have a potential solution before people start having heart attacks and strokes. If we introduce a double bond into the fatty acid, like we do with oleic acid here and linolenic acid, that double bond changes the direction of the chain, changes the shape of the molecule and makes it more irregular. Remember, the more irregular the molecule, the lower the melting temperatures and boiling temperatures. And the more double bonds you add, normally the greater the effect on the melting temperature. So oleic acid and linolenic acid, they've already melted by the time they get into the body at 38 degrees Celsius. They are liquids in the blood plasma, making the blood less thick, more fluidic, and therefore making it easier for the heart to pump blood around the body. So double bonds often make the molecule more irregular and bring down melting temperatures. Just be on the lookout because we do have these fats that we refer to as trans fats. These are molecules with double bonds, which are the exception. They are not bringing down the melting temperature because the double bond doesn't change the direction of the molecule. We refer to these as trans fats because the double bond is referred to as a trans double bond. Easiest way to demonstrate that is to think about those hydrogens which are projecting off the carbons we talked about a minute ago. With a double bond here, remember we've got one, two, three bonds in total. And we said in chapter four with three bonds around a central point the carbon at that point should be trigonal planar. Trigonal planar with a bond angle of 120 degrees. So there's one bond angle at 120 
And so the third bond, the bond to the hydrogen, should be there, roughly. Badly, draw, badly drawn, of course. Same with the carbon here, a third bond there to give us that one, two, three trigonal planar shape. And so with these molecules, when the double bond changes the shape, the hydrogens, as we look through the double bond itself, the hydrogens are on the same side of the plane of the double bond. This is what we sometimes refer to as a cis conformation. And it's the same for any double bond which makes the molecule change direction. The hydrogens attached are together on the same side of the bond as we look through that plane. However, if we look at these trans fats, like the one we had on the next page, or the bottom of this page, we now look for those hydrogens attached, making up the trigonal planar shape. There'd be one there and one there. They would be on opposite sides of the plane of the carbon to carbon bond. This is what we call a trans bond. So if these trans double bonds are trans fats, they stay regular. And so the melting temperatures don't come down. And that's why you occasionally see commercials or adverts talking about their food being healthier for you because they don't have any trans fats. They'll often talk about them being polyunsaturates, which is a reference to the presence of double bonds because that reduces the amount of hydrogen in the molecule. Okay, let me take a quick break and see how my daughter's doing. Okay, we're back. And just a quick summary, actually, we've got left. Just keep in mind that these intermolecular bonding forces are very weak. They're not significant compared to covalent and ionic bonding forces. We can tell that because of the amount of energy required to disrupt and break up these different forces. So for our weakest kind of intermolecular bonding force, induced dipole to induced dipole interactions, well, it takes about, at most, 2,000 calories per mole of energy at one time. And all molecules are capable of these induced dipole to induced dipole interactions, as long as they have close proximity to each other. We also have these dipole to dipole interactions, which are stronger. We can see that because it takes more energy. 6,000 calories of energy per mole to break them up. And that's when we've got polar covalent bonds in the molecule. And in our strongest kind of intermolecular bonding force, hydrogen bonding, which takes even more energy, sometimes as much as 10 kcals per mole. And remember, that's because of the hydrogen being in the polar covalent bond and the close proximity we get to of, of molecules because hydrogen only has one shell. It's the smallest element in the universe. And we're really only talking about molecules with oxygen to hydrogen bonds, fluorine to hydrogen bonds, or nitrogen to hydrogen bonds. Okay, that's it for our Monday lecture, our wrap up. Remember chapter seven is a one week chapter so the following week will be on to the chapter seven exam and impending deadlines for homework and polling questions. Okay, I'll talk to everybody soon. Stay safe, wash your hands, wear that mask properly.